Too often, women are judged by the way they look rather than what they do, think and say. This film tells the story of six women or groups of women who have changed the world by thinking, saying and doing. We begin by interpreting archive images of these women from the women's library collections and then went on to research their achievements. Whether campaigning for world peace or a world free of domestic violence, for the right to vote or equal opportunities at work, these women have made a difference to our lives today. How to change the world. Step one, stand up for those without a voice. You will not find great people coming forward, eager to give their names to this crusade. The degradation of these poor, unhappy women is not degradation for them alone. It is a blow to the dignity of every virtuous woman too. This unequal standard has more or less coloured and shaped the whole of our social life. We are human first, women secondarily. Who am I? What is my name? What was I campaigning for? Do you know who Josephine Butler was? I don't live in this country, I must tell you. Do you know who Josephine Butler was? No, I don't. Huh? Josephine Butler. I've got no idea. Josephine Butler. Uh, it sounds very really familiar, but I couldn't say. Give me a hint. This image shows that Butler is, on the surface, young, gentle and pretty. Her relaxed features and passive expression seem to show that she has lived a comfortable life looking very much like a Victorian conformist. However, the combination of a political family, personal tragedy and the Christian values led her to question society and strive to make changes. Do you think there are any problems for women involved in prostitution today? Um, I think a lot of prostitutes are involved through addiction, which is probably their biggest challenge. Yes, I think there are tremendous numbers of problems for um, any women, men, sex workers around the world. I think that it happens is bad enough, really. Butler improved the lives of women in prostitution by campaigning for the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act, which meant that women could no longer be subjected to embarrassing and painful medical examinations. She challenged the notorious Victorian double moral standard and raised the age of consent from just 12 years old to 16. Butler achieved huge social and legal reforms at a time when women did not even have the vote. Do you think it's your responsibility to do something around it? Yes. If I knew of anything I could do to stop it, I would. I'm an interested citizen, but beyond um, supporting, I suppose, public reform, I don't see an individual responsibility, I have to say no. What could you do if you Well, make life safer for them, especially for their children. I just think they need some security, some social help. Josephine Butler was a prolific writer who composed numerous pamphlets, letters and articles over several decades that reinforced her campaign. This simple image of her sitting in her parlour with a pile of books challenges the stereotype that anyone wanting to change society must be loud, confrontational and take to the streets to get their voices heard. Do you think there's a need for someone like her? Oh, tremendously, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, there is a need. Who that person is, they might be who you never know. Um, they need to be brought forward and stand on the pedestal. Before finding out about Josephine Butler, I was unaware of the gravity of the current situation. However, ignorance is no excuse. This is everyone's responsibility. Josephine's 17 years of campaigning taught me that you shouldn't give up. I admire Josephine Butler because although prostitution didn't directly affect her, she still took responsibility. I think Josephine Butler was extremely brave because she risked her reputation to save others. I feel frustrated as despite what Josephine Butler managed to achieve, there are still massive issues surrounding prostitution that need to be addressed. What are you going to do? How to change the world. Step two. Don't leave it up to others. Take a stand.
women's suffrage represents the first stage in the demand for political equality. In 1918, women in Britain first got the vote, and in 1928, women were granted the vote on the same basis as men. We are going to tell the story of how one woman helped to change women's lives forever. Emily Pankhurst is widely known for her determined leadership of those aiming to get women the vote in this country. This photograph is typical of her campaign. It shows Emily capturing the attention of the people, men as well as women, in a mass rally in Trafalgar Square in 1908. Emmeline Pankhurst was widely known for the power of her speech making. Her movement, the Women's Social and Political Union, was also a byword for fearless action. Initially, the WSPU, or suffragettes, as they were known, staged peaceful campaigns. But, after 1905, frustration at their lack of progress led them to become more militant. Their motto was, Deeds, not words. They took part in increasingly headline-grabbing protests including window smashing, hunger strikes and arson attacks. In 1912 alone, Emmeline Pankhurst was arrested, re-arrested and released 12 times. This photograph was taken at Bow Magistrates Court in 1908. In the photo, Emmeline and her companions look rather relaxed and we know that they spoke for themselves in their trial. Clearly this was not Emmeline's first court appearance. Emmeline, her eldest daughter Christabel, and another WSBU member, Flora Drummond, were arrested for incitement to disorder. In later years, Emmeline took part in hunger strikes in prison and faced the horror of force feeding. In 1914, Emmeline and her supporters decided to call off their campaign when the First World War broke out. In the war years, they played a crucial role in the war effort, and it was partly through this that they earned the right for women over the age of 30 to get the vote in 1918. If we win it, this hardest of all fights, then, to be sure, in the future it is going to be made easier for women all over the world to win their fight when their time comes. Emily Pankhurst died in 1928, ten years after she had finally achieved the goal she had pursued all her life. Research has shown that in Britain, well over 50% of 18 to 24 year olds have voted on Big Brother, while less than 10% voted at the last general election. Emmeline Pankhurst dedicated her life to her beliefs, but we can't even be bothered to take a few moments to act on our beliefs. Women need to continue to fight to gain and use their vote. Political equality is vital before women can hope to achieve social and economic equality around the world. After the success of Emmeline's campaign, she stood to be elected as an MP, but even she was not successful. Today, women are still not equally represented in Parliament. We think now that women are able to vote for their leaders, we should strive to become leaders. How to change the world. Step 3. Use your vote. When this photograph was taken, nobody would have guessed that in a few years time, this composed and well-educated woman would become a martyr. She is suffragette Emily Walding Davison. Was she right to kill herself for what she believed in? How much would you sacrifice for justice? It's one step closer to equality. Lizzie, she looks like an angel. Some angel. She killed herself. Silence. Firstly, we are not ragamuffins. Use full names at all times, ladies. And secondly... The suffragette is banned reading material. But it's politics, sir. Politics. Throwing yourself in front of the king's horse is hardly politics. But if she were a man? Don't be ridiculous. Do you think a man would be that reckless? But men and women are born equal, so why is it as we grow up we lose our inequality? She did it for the vote, she did it for women. He who has greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Ladies, in the Bible, it says that women must serve men at all times. But what would you know about that? You're just little girls. So why educate us if we're just little girls? I've had enough of this. Girls, stick to your sewing. I've got a boys' chemistry class to teach. 
With Miss Davidson's education, she could have gone quite far. Do you think it hurt? Getting crushed by a horse? Of course it hurt. Well, I think she's either really depressed or mad. No, she was brave and passionate. Did you know that she got fourth left 49 times in jail, all for women? And also, she was still the life and soul of every party. You know she played the piano as well. The piano, you're obsessed, both of you, goodness. But it's good to be well informed. She may win off the vote yet. There'd be riots. Whose side are you on? I'm just thinking realistically. With equality will come riots and immorality. You're saying it's not realistic for women across England to have hope that they'll ever get the vote. Look at the suffragettes. At least they're trying to change something. You know, I think we should join them. Emily Wilding Davison inspired hundreds of men and women across England. Nearly a hundred years later, she still inspires us. Emily Wilding Davison was an extreme example of women's loyalty to their campaigns. Her defiance and vision were inspirational to all women embarking on fights for their causes. She gave women hope and a chance to show what they're really capable of. One person can change the world and every vote counts. Stand up if you will use your vote. How to change the world. Step four, women can do it too. If you are accused of murder, who would you want to defend you? A man or a woman? Take a look. Take a closer look. Is this a man or a woman? Would you take me more seriously like this or like this? This is Helena Florence Normanton. This is how she really looked. So why did she dress like a man? When I was born on the 14th of December, 1882, only men could be barristers. But my father died under mysterious circumstances when I was four years old. And this deeply affected me. I wanted to fight for justice, but I couldn't. So I obtained a first class degree in modern history at London University and then trained as a teacher. This was an acceptable career for women in those days. But this wasn't enough for me. So then I went to Dijon University where I obtained a diploma in French language literature and history. Helena was not admitted as a member of the Middle Temple until 1919, following the removal of the Sex Disqualification Act. By the time she was already 37 years old. In 1922, she was invited to the bar and was the first woman to practice as a barrister. She was nearly 40. Helena went on to be the first woman to prosecute a murder trial and to conduct a trial in America. Not forgetting being the first woman King's Counsel and the first woman to represent cases at both the High Court and the Old Bailey, I was also one of the first women to take silk, that means to be appointed to the Queen's Council, which is the highest order of barrister that you can be. Oh, husband, have you ever heard of the dreadful Helena Normanton? She wants to keep her maiden name. What a woman! She even wants her passport to know her maiden name. Apparently, she believes that men and women should keep their money and properly set her. Mm, I'm not sure. When Helena Normanton wrote for Good Housekeeping magazines, she wrote it as a woman, but when she wrote a book about law, she wrote it as a man. I have Mrs. Booth, Tony Blair's wife, who is also a barrister, you know, here. Mrs. B Booth, why do you think Helena Normanton did this? Maybe it was the only way she could get herself pu um, published, but she wasn't giving up in any way. She was just proving that women can make as many sales as men. Why do you think it's important to have female barristers? Women understand other women and represent them. We deserve good jobs. The law isn't just in the man's world. Thank you, Mrs. Booth. Helena Normanton sadly died in October 1957. She is buried in Ovingdon Churchyard in Kent. How has Helena Normanton inspired you guys, Tamanna? Helena Normanton has inspired me because she's very important to us girls, especially seeing as we have a girls' school. Majority want to go into law, so we couldn't have done it without Helena Normanton. I admire her because, like, you know the way she campaigned? She done it in a non-violent way. Well, she inspired me because she kept on surname 
and she showed that she didn't want to be, be in a man's position. She gave us hope and taught us that we could be whatever we want. If you're a girl, do you think there are some jobs you can't do? If you're a boy, do you think there are some jobs that girls can't do? When you get married, do you want to keep your own surname? Did you know that until 1933 women couldn't get a divorce? If you are accused of murder, who would you want to defend you? A man or a woman? change the world. Step five, make yourself heard. Would you stand up for what you believe in? Do you share her passion? It's 3 p.m. of Wednesday, the 22nd of July, 1984. We're here at the RAF Greenham Common Airbase, home to the Greenham Common Women Peace Camp. And as you can see, 30,000 protesters all protesting. These women are of all ages, races and religions, united about their belief that Britain should not be part of the nuclear armament. These women are from all walks of life, and I'm new to go in, get the best picture, grab some of the action. So women, leave the hairbrushes, forget the hairdos, grab some wellies, and let's go and meet them. It seems as if we have found someone. Just give me one second. Hi, sorry. How have your experiences been at Greenham Common? Uh, well, I've been here for a year and I think it's had a really positive impact on my life. Yeah, and uh, what made you come down here? What motivated you to come down here? Please um, tell the camera. Well, I felt passionately and still feel passionate about Britain's involvement with Trident and other issues. And I think the Cold War has gone on for too long mm. and it must end. Yeah. And we must never again see the events of Vietnam. These women first came here on the 5th of September 1981. Despite constant arrests, this protest has not let up. Instead, it has just got stronger and stronger and more women have come to join. And as you can see, as you can see, you know, this has not let up. Three years running and it is rock solid. I tell you, whoa! and our freedom of speech is being forgotten. Greenham Common women were arrested constantly until it had become almost farcical. However, today the implications for protesting are much more serious with the introduction of the Terrorism Act. I have rights! What is this? Let me go! From going on the peace protests against the war in Lebanon last year, I found that the police presence there was really oppressive. But what the Greenham Common women have taught me is to fight for what I believe in regardless. 
What I've learnt from the Green and Common Women is that protesting isn't just about holding up placards and chanting, it's also about having fun. Ever since World War II and the signing of peace treaties, there hasn't been a day of peace. And currently, Britain is considering renewing the Trident. I believe I want peace, and Greenham Common has taught me to fight for peace in a peaceful way, and that is what I'm going to do. I think that I was born in the wrong era, and I would have loved to live when Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was around. How to change the world. Step six. Struggle. Don't submit. One in four women have experienced domestic violence. Approximately every minute, the police receive a call for assistance in cases of domestic violence. Women on average suffer seven years of domestic violence before seeking help. Ethnic minority women on average suffer longer. Domestic violence claims the lives of two women each week. Men who abuse get away with murder. Women who fight back get charged with murder. My name is Mina Patel, I work at Sample Black Sisters, I'm a joint coordinator and I've been working there for nearly 22 years. Your group has inspired us, two people haven't heard about you. Um, what does your organisation do and how did you come about? South of Black Sisters is a women's organisation and we came about in um, the 70s. And at that time we were a group of women who were fighting around the issue of race, racism. Um, and it's through that that we developed um, having to look at issues that dealt with women um, within the home. And um, although the community was very up in arms in terms about racism during that period, everyone got together to fight racism, but um, alongside of that, what they failed to do is look at issues that affected women within the home, particularly around the issue of domestic violence. And so in 1983, we managed to get um, some funding from the Greater London Authority and set up the first Black Women's Centre in West London. Um, when we set that up, we weren't quite sure the kind of um, women that were going to come to us and what the issues were going to be. And we were very surprised um, when they did come to us. It was mainly around domestic violence. Hello, South of Black Sisters. In 1992, Kirinjit Ahluwalia, who fought back and killed her husband after 10 years of horrific abuse, was cleared of murder, thanks to South of Black Sisters' relentless campaign for justice. Can you tell us about this picture and your experience with Karen Jeet's case? I think this, this case will stay with me for the rest of my life. And for us, when we started this, we weren't, um, we didn't think that this campaign would become so big and so internationally recognised as well. Um, and when we started it, um, we had to work very closely with the legal system in order to find fresh evidence to present in court so that she has a right of appeal. And that was really a lengthy and hard job to do because solicitors wouldn't do that kind of work. The result of this case, domestic violence, is something that's recognised in courts now, um, and particularly around minority cultures and things. If you could think of one piece of advice, one key message um, to us as young women um, who would want to change the world, what would you say? What I would say to you, the struggle isn't over because politics and the state in which religious fundamentalism is going to bring women backwards and we need to continue to fight and make sure that women's rights are being heard across the world, not just in this country, but across the world. This whole section of the film is about, I mean, South Black Sisters, shows that we should never ever give up. And South Black Sisters have struggled a lot to achieve what they have achieved. Despite having had any support from the community or from the media, they still struggled and were determined to accomplish what they wanted to achieve. Having someone um, from the period of Kiranjit um, here standing in front of you is, um, is really amazing. Coming here today and meeting Mina from South of Black Sisters, I have learned a lot and she has inspired me in a lot of ways. I, 
I've learned about discrimination against race and how that is a big problem that they had faced before and that we still face today. And that just shows that if you want to make change, it is a commitment. You have to be committed and you have to be dedicated to get what you want. Why are we standing here? Are our voices being heard? Who got life? Him or her? We hope you've been inspired by these women. Step up to the challenge. Lobby an embassy. Educate yourself so you can form an opinion. Don't shrink away from an issue just because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Never give up. Combat climate change. Don't be silenced. Speak out. Sign an online petition. Support a charity. Write to your MP. Raise awareness amongst your friends. Write to the Prime Minister. Don't use violence. Write a book. Make a film. Make people more aware of successful women. Never give up. Don't be afraid. Always work together. Be proud of your body. Education is empowerment. Fight racism. Be the role model that you wish to aspire to.